Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight, information on a foreign nation's nuclear capabilities reportedly seized at former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. What it could mean for that investigation. R. Kelly's co-defendant testifies about early allegations made against the R&B singer. That and other updates from the Chicago trial. The great resignation didn't pass us by. Two more longtime city council members say this week they won't run for re-election. Our Spotlight Politics team looks at the aldermanic exodus and much more. Dispensary owners and advocates want Illinois to be more equitable in deciding who can legally sell and grow weed in Illinois. Here's an opportunity to elevate community concerns and their voices. Meet three members of Chicago's first civilian police oversight board and hear about their goals to rebuild trust in the police department. And famous disasters reimagined on canvas. We introduce you to a local artist inspired by history and catastrophe. But first, some of today's top stories. Around 25% of the city will be seeing new leadership next year as the exits at City Hall keep coming. Alderman Howard Brookins Jr. is the latest to announce he will not seek re-election. In a statement, Brookins says that after 20 years leading the South Side's 21st ward, he is, quote, ready to hand the reins over to a new generation of leadership. He's the ninth city council member to announce they will not run for re-election, with another three alder people announcing bids for mayor. We'll have more on the City Hall exodus coming up in Spotlight Politics. One of R. Kelly's co-defendants and former business manager took the stand at the R&B Singers trial today. Daryl McDavid said he didn't believe allegations that Kelly had sexually abused minors in the 1990s. And not only did he think the claims were false, but were the, quote, cost of doing business in the entertainment industry. And before that testimony began, the judge ruled that music reporter Jim DeRogatis will not have to take the witness stand. We'll hear more details on that and McDavid's testimony later in the program. More than 100 immigrants arrived in Chicago today by bus from Texas. This brings the total number of immigrants bused to Chicago by Texas Governor Greg Abbott to 228 people. A statement from Mayor Lori Lightfoot's office says, quote, in partnership with our colleagues from local community-based organizations, Cook County and the state of Illinois, we are providing these individuals and families with emergency shelter and connection to needed services. City officials launched a website to allow people to donate supplies and money. People can also register through the city online if they're interested in volunteering to help. Up next, the latest on the investigation into documents seized at former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Major developments this week in the investigation into the former president's handling of classified documents at his private country club. A federal judge has granted Donald Trump's request for an independent review on the government documents seized from Mar-a-Lago last month. And the Washington Post is reporting that among those documents, there was information describing a foreign government's military defenses, including its nuclear capabilities. And joining us now with more is Joe Walsh, a former Republican congressman from Illinois and host of the White Flag with Joe Walsh podcast, and Juliet Sorensen, professor of international law at Northwestern University. She's also a former assistant U.S. attorney. We welcome both of you back to Chicago tonight. Uh, Juliet Sorensen to that Washington Post report uh, saying that the DOJ recovered the top secret classified information related to nuclear weapons capabilities of an unnamed country. How serious a potential crime is it to be in possession of such a document? It has the potential to be extremely serious. Now, we don't know uh, precisely what the documents were. We also don't know what the surrounding or supporting evidence might be that might inculpate former President Trump. Um, but when you're talking about documents related to nuclear weapons, uh, it raises the specter of potential espionage, treason, and by the way, treaty violations, because the United States is party to a number of international treaties related to those nuclear weapons. So, so these are major statutes that perhaps this investigation is looking into. Joe, does this revelation uh, give this investigation more urgency in your mind? 
Yeah, Paris, it sure does. And uh, again, every every Republican should be upset uh, with what with what uh, is being found down there. Uh, Juliet's right. I mean, these are these could be very serious violations. The American people should be angry. Uh, and, and yet Republicans, Paris, generally continue to stay quiet. Look, Trump wants to delay. That's all this is about. The special master now uh, being appointed by this judge. This will enable Trump to just kick this down the road. And that's all he's trying to do. All right. Now let's get into that special master. Uh, it was appointed by a, a Trump appointed judge in Florida, Aileen Cannon, uh, granting that request. So the special master uh, is there to sift through the documents that were seized. Remind us, Juliet Sorensen, the role of a special master and, and who that person might end up being. Paris, the term special master is one of those legal terms that sounds more complicated or fancier than it actually is. Um, it is not an uncommon situation for a court to appoint uh, someone who's intended to be a neutral third party to do what's happening in this case, which is to conduct a review of documents for a specific reason. And in this, uh, in this instance, of course, the special master is reviewing documents seized by the FBI when they conducted their search of Mar-a-Lago to determine if there are any documents there that are protected by a legally applicable privilege, either attorney-client privilege or executive privilege. Does it make it more difficult, Juliet, to find a, a, an appropriate person to be a special master when you consider that these documents uh, ostensibly can only be seen by a handful of high clearance individuals in the U.S. government. I wouldn't say a handful, but yes, the special master does need to meet those qualifications. That person needs to be agreed upon by both parties, approved by the judge, and it goes without saying, be someone of impeccable integrity for a case that's as, as sensitive as this one. All right, uh, Joe Walsh, you got into the politics here a little bit. Uh, most Republicans, uh, with a few notable ex exceptions, have seemed to settle into this messaging strategy of, of defending Trump and going after the investigators. This is uh, a strategy we've seen over and over again. Do you think anything else would come out that would get more Republicans to jump? No, I don't, Paris, unfortunately. And let's put to bed, let's put to rest the notion that my former political party, the Republican Party, is the party of law and order. I mean, think about this. The president of the United States took, illegally took top secret documents down to his home at Mar-a-Lago, and Republicans want the FBI investigated. They're going after law enforcement for just doing their jobs here. Uh, they're going to protect Donald Trump as long as they can. Joe, one of those notable exceptions I mentioned is the former U.S. attorney, a conservative, uh, Bill Barr, uh, saying he thinks the DOJ may be close to having everything it needs to, to indict. He disagreed with the judge's ruling on the special master. He's gone on Fox News, uh, which has a lot of conservative Trump-supporting viewers, to make that case. Do you think that that has any impact? No, Bill Barr's not a Republican running for office. Look, let's not forget that Bill Barr enabled Donald Trump while he served as uh, attorney general. Uh, Bill Barr has also, Paris, made it clear that if Donald Trump is the 2024 Republican nominee, he'll still vote for him. So I, 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 don't, I don't really give Bill Barr much attention with what he's saying. I would pay attention, Paris, if actual Republicans running for office stood up and spoke out against what Trump has done illegally. And certainly it doesn't seem like we've seen that yet. Uh, Juliet Sorensen, uh, Joe made the point that he believes this whole special master battle is, is a way to uh, basically delay this investigation. Does the judge's ruling delay uh, the DOJ's ability uh, to investigate th these very serious potential crimes you were talking about? It, you know, Paris, it does, um, but it may only delay it on the margins by a matter of weeks. Truthfully, if it delays in the name of getting it right, that is to say protecting legally, legally applicable privileges, uh, that's a good thing because think of it this way. You don't want something overturned on appeal after time and lengthy resources have been spent at the trial court level. So better to get it right on the front end uh, than to have it upended uh, and have material suppressed or deemed a violation of privilege on the back end. And there's a lot of talk, though, Juliet, that the DOJ might appeal this decision from Judge Cannon to appoint a special master. Do you think they will do that? And will that uh, action delay uh, investigations? 
An appeal would delay it. Uh, they can uh, take an appeal from this ruling, an interlocutory appeal, it is called. I'm sure that the DOJ is weighing right now the likelihood of success on appeal, uncertain in my view, um, the delay uh, itself, um, and also the extent to which they can bide their time and proceed with other aspects of the investigation while they wait for the special master to be appointed and complete their review. Joe Walsh, you made the point several times that do you believe the GOP is still firmly Donald Trump's party no matter what? He's out com campaigning uh, in places like Pennsylvania, Ohio for the midterms. Do you think this investigation has any impact uh, on Republicans' chances in the midterms? Yeah, uh, Paris, because I think as long as Donald Trump is the topic, it will turn independents and moderate voters toward the Democratic Party. Look, Trump's a great get out the vote tool for Democrats. He gets the Republican base out, but as long as Trump's the issue, the rest of America comes out against him. So paradoxically, the Democrats now have a great chance to retain control of one or both houses, whereas a couple months ago, that might not have been the case. All right, there seem to be developments in this every single day. We'll keep following it. But for now, our thanks to Joe Walsh and Juliet Sorensen. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And now to Brandis and calls for more equity in the marijuana industry. Brandis. In Paris, it's been over two years since Illinois signed what's considered one of the most equitable laws to legalize the use of cannabis. And even though just last month the state issued a second round of conditional dispensary licenses, some advocates say the state is still making it harder for social equity applicants to build and grow their cannabis businesses. Here to talk about those regulations and the push to change them are Kiana Hughes, executive director of Chicago Normal, the local chapter of the National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws and Christian Mitchell, Illinois Deputy Governor. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Kiana Hughes, let's start with you, please. Your organization, along with two others, the Cannabis Equity Illinois Coalition and West Side Visionaries, say that the state's regulations are actually hurting efforts to grow your businesses. Uh, tell us how, please. Sure, first of all, thank you for having us and bringing uh, light to this really important, to these important issues. We came together specifically for this press conference today to bring together all different types of license holders because one of the things that we're hearing is that on every level, licensees are hitting obstacles that are being put in place or that are just kind of left in place, whether it's by um, actual legislation, whether it's by the rules, whether it's by the interpretations of the law. So for example, you might have, um, there are some dispensary owners that are all dispensary owners. All you get when you get the license is a conditional license. Your license isn't real until you're actually able to open your doors. Well, as you can imagine, a lot of social equity licensees are trying to raise capital uh, to get to the point where they can actually open their doors. One of the rules is being interpreted as saying that you cannot um, sell or exchange any portion of ownership or equity in your company in order to get investors for your business. So it's making it very hard for them to raise capital. You have people on the craft grow side who are having a hard time being able to raise capital to just outfit um, a 5,000 square foot canopy space with the potential to grow to 14,000 square feet in the future. We're hearing a lot where they're saying, you know, investors are saying that's not enough or that will not be lucrative enough, or you will not be able to produce enough cannabis to really be competitive in this market at such a low canopy space. Why should we have to wait and apply for extensions 3,000 square feet at a time? Um, and, and really, I don't even know that there is a mechanism in place to ask for that or allow that if you were in a place to get it. And but why should Kiana, we wait for that? Yes. So uh, it sounds like, obviously, it sounds like some barriers you're saying that uh, you believe the state Not has erected up. different ways. Um, I want to get Deputy Governor Christian Mitchell in on this. On this. Uh, what do you say to some of those concerns, Deputy Governor? Yeah, first of all, thank you for, for having me, and, and thanks to, to Kiana for being willing to talk about this. I think I'd say a couple of things. First of all, owner member equity is multifaceted. So we've already got $112 million in tax revenue being returned to communities hardest hit by the war on drugs, and more than 800,000 convictions or arrest records that have been expunged, giving folks a new lease on life. But to get right to the business side of this, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, 
We're just seeing some of these agenda items for the first time today from the sheet we're able to obtain that folks were handing out at the, the presser. And there are things that the administration has already publicly said we support, right, that require legislative change. We believe that going to 14,000 square feet of canopy is a good idea. We've signed on to that. We believe that making sure that badging is um, is is uh, that is consistent across uh, categories is a really good idea. We think those are good things. They require changes in the law, not just the governor's pen. So the, the thing that, that uh, was just being discussed relative to principal owners, we're hearing two different sides of this. On the one hand, you've got owners who are saying, hey, we want to change principal officers so we can raise capital right now because we need it. On the other hand, you have a pretty much an equal number of folks saying, hey, wait a second. We've got principal officers who have been holding this for a couple of years. They're people of color. We want that growth in this industry. What we don't want is some of these predatory folks who are coming in and saying, hey, I'll give you some cash, but you've got to give me a majority stake in your business. Do we have to rescore that license now? Is that true social equity if now a majority person has bought in, has the stake, and now is saying I'm a social equity license because this person who originally had the license is a conditional holder? These are all nuanced debates that we need to have. My office door is open, as is the governor's. Our phone lines are open. There are multiple members of the coalition who have contact info for us. we got to sit down and have a nuanced conversation about this and the future of social equity in the dispensary and, and craft growth space. Kiana, what's been the impact of some of these regulations? I imagine folks have spent a lot of time and probably money up to this point uh, to still find themselves limited. Well, if you think about it, it's been three years. Um, we were supposed to get these licenses. Well, it's been three years since we applied. Uh, it's been two years that we were supposed to get the licenses back in 2020. A lot of people didn't get their licenses until 2022, especially when you're talking about some of the dispensary licenses and, and that. So they have already spent uh, copious amounts of money, tens of thousands of dollars, just to keep things going in the meantime. Uh, none of this has met anyone's expectations in terms of how it was going to go or even how, what you might have explained to your initial investors or to your initial people. So we're happy to finally have a seat at the table and have an audience with um, with Christian Lieutenant Governor Mitchell, or excuse me, Deputy Governor Mitchell, as well as uh, Governor Pritzker and anyone who can help us in this, because we have certainly been beating this particular drum and, and sounding off a lot of these issues for at least the past year. And now we're just getting as more licenses are being released, we're just getting more and more issues and more and more roadblocks. Uh, Deputy Governor, what more could the state do to address some of these concerns? It sounds like a conversation needs to happen, but there are also changes that can be made both, you know, uh, through the, the state's regulating agency, but also uh, through legislators. Yeah, I mean, look, we've got we've to all come together and I think work with the legislature to make changes. The canopy space one is obvious. We do need to have this discussion about social equity uh, in the conditional licensing space. Again, there is the one side that says, let us add principal owners and add cash. There's the other that says, well, if that means reduce black and Latino ownership for folks who are currently social equity uh, license holders, is that the right outcome for the state? That those are two legitimate sides to a debate. We've got to weigh that and come to a place where we can do something that meets the original definition of social equity and the expectations of the people in the legislature. On some of these other more technical issues that folks are talking about, for transporters, for infusers, many of those things are currently in the legislation, so we're going to have to negotiate that with the legislature. But again, like our office door is open. We are ready to have that conversation. In the meantime, we're going to continue working with DCO to get loan funds out to some of those owners who qualify for social equity loans that will help with the liquidity issue immediately. We are working on that now. We just had a meeting about that today. So we're going to continue doing everything we can from the administrative side to keep pushing these things through and out and be helpful. And we want to work with our partners like Chicago Normal and others to address some of these more complicated issues in a way that makes sure that we can get everything moving so that we are meeting the expectation so of the cannabis industry in the country. More work to be done. Uh, it sounds like we'll be hearing from all of you uh, after you've had the chance to get together and discuss it on your own. Uh, for now, we'll have to leave it there. Kiana Hughes and uh, Illinois Deputy Governor Christian Mitchell, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Up next, famous disasters reimagined on canvas. Stay with us for a look. We've made it. Justice Jackson's appointment to the Supreme Court provides a beacon of hope. Black women are underrepresented. We still rise. We still show up for one another. It's us investing in the next generation and giving them something to enrich the next generation with.
word of warning, our next story contains images that are as frightening as they are fascinating. A Chicago artist paints accurate historical depictions of terrifying tragedies, fires and tornadoes, and nautical disasters that took place in Chicago and elsewhere. Producer Mark Vitale met a painter inspired by history and catastrophe. A railway disaster in Ohio in 1867, a circus fire in Connecticut in 1944, and the sinking of the Lady Elgin in Lake Michigan in 1860. These depictions of calamity were made by local artist Eric Edward Esper, whose work has been featured on WTTW's Chicago Stories. Here's his recreation of the Iroquois Theater Fire of 1903. It makes sense that his work ended up on PBS. I originally became interested in history from reading war history, which is very, you know, disastrous itself. And then uh, I became interested in uh, historical disasters from watching documentaries on Channel 11, WTTW. The first one was uh, the Eastland disaster, which inspired me to make a painting of it. And uh, I painted that and it sold right away and I decided that'd be a good body of work to continue with. They range from well-known, the Loop L train derailment in 1977, to lesser known, the 1909 Chicago water crib fire, which took place two miles offshore. There's an emphasis on the Midwest. For instance, the 1896 tornado that struck downtown St. Louis and the firestorm in Peshtico, Wisconsin, that occurred the same day as the Great Chicago Fire, which Esper has also painted. These are all like, yeah, references from different angles. Long before he applies oil paint to canvas, he does his homework. A lot of research, yeah. I watch as much information on TV I can find, lots of internet searches for photographs, lots of that. And I read two or three books if I can find that many on the event. That's important to me to try and get the details right. It takes a long time, six months to a year for, for painting usually. Esper works as an art installer in River North at Gallery Victor, which also represents him. When he moved to Chicago from Michigan, he was a landscape painter. His paintings are often done from a bird's eye point of view. My objective was to show as much as I could to not just zoom in on one portion of this. I like to capture the whole scene to put it into perspective. And the bird's eye view has that kind of, uh, what do you say, early American illustration quality to it. Sometimes he paints landscapes of places related to notorious moments. This is the Spahn Ranch in California, headquarters to Charles Manson and his family. And here is the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. Other dark days depicted in Chicago history include the fire at Our Lady of the Angels and the ill-fated Flight 191. I always try and keep it a little tasteful without trying to depict death. It's more of realizing that's happening than it is depicting it. A lot of things have, have inspired me to paint these. Uh, I used to do antique poster restoration, so I was into this old illustration poster. Then I got into the history from watching documentaries and inspired me to paint these most dramatic scenes I could imagine, you know, there's not a sunny day at the beach in any of these, so I thought it was an interesting story that behind every one of these incidents that would draw people in to think a little bit more about what they're looking at, you know, it's something to uh, try to remember. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. Again, the artist is Eric Edward Esper, and you can see more of his work on our website. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, R. Kelly's co-defendant testifies about early allegations made against the R&B singer. Then another update from the Chicago trial. As two more older people say they've had enough, what is behind the growing exodus from City Hall? Our Spotlight Politics team on that and more. And three members of Chicago's first civilian police oversight board tell us how they hope to rebuild trust in the police department. But first, some more of today's top stories. A new report finds more than 800 Illinois residents were included on leaked membership rolls for the far-right Oath Keepers, 
Of those, 21 are believed to be law enforcement, two believed to be military, and three are elected officials. The report from the Anti-Defamation League Center on Extremism examined a leaked membership poll of the extremist group that's accused of playing a large role in the January 6th insurrection. The ADL doesn't identify any of the Illinois residents, but they also note that a person's inclusion in the database doesn't necessarily mean they're an active member of the group. Safety advocates are calling for more pedestrian protections in Lakeview. Several advocacy groups biked down Belmont this evening demanding that bike infrastructure be added between Southport and DuSable Lakeshore Drive while the street is being resurfaced. They say the city is failing to utilize opportunities to improve street safety by not planning to add protected bike lanes and bus improvements to this stretch. The Chicago Department of Transportation did not respond to our request for comment. Former President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama were back in the White House for the unveiling of their official portraits. It's happening several years late due to former President Donald Trump not holding a ceremony for his predecessor. Instead, President Joe Biden is hosting the event for his former boss. Obama's portrait will be displayed in the grand foyer of the White House, where portraits of the two most recent presidents are traditionally placed. And Michelle's will likely be along the hallway on the ground floor of the White House alongside some of the previous first ladies. New testimony today in the Chicago trial of R. Kelly, this time from one of the singer's co-defendants. Meanwhile, longtime music journalist Jim DeRogatis gets out of testifying. WTTW News reporter Matt Masterson has been following this case and joins us now. Matt, in this sexual abuse and child pornography trial of R. Kelly, there are two co-defendants. One of them testified today. Who is this person and what was that testimony like? So today it was Daryl McDavid, Kelly's former accountant and business manager, who testified for most of the day about, uh, he, he testified about a wide range of things, but uh, largely about how he didn't believe a lot of these early allegations that were made against Kelly, that he'd had sex with any minors, because he believed that a lot of these accusers were simply trying to get a payout from the singer. He said Kelly's attorney at the time told him that this was the cost of doing business in the entertainment industry. And that it'd be more beneficial to Kelly and his career and his public image to just settle these claims with a payment rather than letting them, them go public, even if they thought these claims were false. Uh, that belief actually extended into one of the accusers in this case, Jane, Kelly's goddaughter, who previously testified that Kelly had sexually abused her hundreds of times while she was a minor. Uh, McDavid said that Kelly had told him he'd never abused Jane and that the allegations were being pushed by his aunt who had, and others who had had a bit of a falling out with Kelly over the years. So, uh, Daryl McDavid, one of three co-defendants here, if you include R. Kelly, what stands out about him? Well, he is the only one of the three who's expected to take the witness stand and testify here. Um, but there has already been plenty of testimony about him. Um, Charles Freeman, another one of Kelly's former associates, previously testified that McDavid and another man had recruited him to recover an illicit sex tape of Kelly with a minor. Uh, McDavid testified today that that claim was false, saying Freeman already had this tape, he didn't need to recover it, and that he was actually uh, trying to extort Kelly by demanding to a payment, otherwise he was going to sell it. Um, another witness, Lisa Van Allen, previously testified that McDavid had made a threatening statement about killing her, uh, and while McDavid hasn't been questioned about that statement yet, he's expected to spend significant more time on the witness stand in the coming days. All right, and also today, a new development in the effort from music journalist Jim DeRogatis to not have to take uh, the witness stand. What happened there? So DeRogatis had been subpoenaed about to testify about this VHS tape that he had been uh, given in 2002 that allegedly showed Kelly abusing uh, one of these minors. Um, he filed an emergency motion this week challenging that subpoena, and the judge this morning agreed that his testimony was rather unnecessary after the girl who was in that tape, she's been referred to as Jane, already testified about the validity of that video that was shown to jurors in this case. So he will not have to take the witness stand. And Matt, you said yesterday, it looks like uh, because of the delay on Tuesday, the holiday Monday, this uh, case might drag into next week before uh, the jury goes into deliberations. Is that what it's looking like? Yeah, there's likely much more tes testimony from Daryl McDavid. He testified for a large portion of the day today, and ex it's expected it might take all day tomorrow as well. Um, so while the case was expected to be wrapped up this week, with the delay, with the long testimony, it's very possible that this does drag into next week. All right, Matt, we know you'll be following it, and thank you as always. Thanks, Paris. And you can read Matt's full story on our website, wttw.com news. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you.
Paris thanks and of course stay right there. The aldermanic exodus from City Hall gathers pace as two more veteran members call it quits. The feud between Mayor Lightfoot and Texas's governor grows as more migrants are bused to Chicago. And the Chicago Bears are tackling plans to move to Arlington Heights. Joining us is our Spotlight Politics team, Amanda Vinicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. So the aldermanic exodus continues. Um, Alderwoman Susan Sadlowski-Garza announced that she's not running for re-election on Monday. And then we heard from uh, Alderman Howard Brookins today saying that he's not running again. Um, here's a little of what Alderwoman Sadlowski-Garza and the mayor had to say on this recently. I've spent my entire life giving back to people in the 10th Ward, um, 32 years to be exact, uh, as a counselor, an educator, and as an alderwoman. And um, it's time for me to give back to my family and my friends and myself, quite frankly. So the great resignation didn't pass us by. I think people are making um, decisions about, again, what's in the best interest for them and their family. This is a tough environment to be an incumbent, to be a public servant, and many people are making the decision that um, it's time for them to move on and do something else. Heather, is that the whole story? It's been a tough few years and folks need more family time. What do you think is uh, behind the growing, the growing numbers walking out the door? Who's tomorrow? Well, that's the big question. And it's certainly true that a lot of older people had a really rough time during the pandemic. Many struggled to adapt to virtual meetings. And there's no doubt that some older people, like Alderman Howard Brookins, who has served 20 years on the city council, is ready for the next chapter. But Howard Brookins and Susan Sedlowski Garza have something in common. They're both committee chairs. And it used to be that if once you got to be a committee chair, you hung on to that perch as long and as hard as you could because it meant that you had a pretty sweet budget and the ability to push your legislation through the city council. That's what tells me that this is a little bit more than wanting to spend time with their friends and family and uh, an indication that City Hall is a very, very hard place to work right now. Amanda, there's also been some criticism of the mayor rubbing folks the wrong way with her leadership style. Uh, do you think that that has anything to do with what we're seeing? You know, there, there's certainly talk about that, Brandis, but I think that folks need to be particularly careful about that. It's not as if her predecessor was known for being a chummy, happy-go-lucky guy that was easy to work with. He certainly did have, however, a change in um, leadership style. And uh, Mayor, Light, Mayor Lightfoot, while she hasn't necessarily, I, I think, um, arguably followed through on some of her promises when it comes to transparency and letting in the light, she has been more following through on not necessarily wheeling and dealing with older people to get what they want um, in exchange for their vote as much as, say, her predecessors. So that could be part of it. I, I do think that, as Heather noted, that there's something deeper behind this, but we know the great resignation is deep in all sorts of ways in terms of people prioritizing and just how hard it is to be an elected official when you think of the pressure, the decisions, and particularly budget pressures that are coming down the pike. Paris, with so many aldermanic openings, presumably no shortage of candidates, uh, how much could this next election change the dynamics at City Hall? Oh, it's going to change it tremendously. I mean, we're looking at more than a fifth of City Council, if not more, turning over uh, in the next couple of years. And I want to echo what Heather and Amanda said. I mean, I think there's truth to this great resignation thing. I spoke with uh, one alderman last year who said the scuttlebutt was no one's having any fun anymore on this job. It's a serious job. They're not supposed to just go have fun. But there were many aspects of the job that they really did enjoy, especially meetings that were in person and mixing it up. There was a lot of action. And the chaos of 2020, COVID, the high crime has, has really been a drag on. These have been very difficult jobs. Uh, let's let's not you know deny that. They're never but ending. They're, they're never off. They're, they're, when you're an older person. Right, right. But let, let's also say that I think a lot of the folks that have announced they're not running again might have faced really tough re-election battles, especially yeah. if they were allied with the mayor. Because you have no, mayor's approval ratings in the 20s, so you're going to have no shortage of candidates uh, opposed to the mayor. And so that might have been some, some tough races that some of these incumbents did not have the stomach to run. And there is no shortage of candidates who are opposed to the mayor, because uh, I, I do want to get to this. Uh, I'll come to you in, in a bit, Amanda. But, you know, Cook County Commissioner uh, Brandon Johnson saying that he's exploring a possible run. Uh, he's also a paid organizer for the Chicago Teachers Union, um, and that seems to set him up for the union's backing. Uh, Heather, what can you tell us about Brandon Johnson and his experience? 
Well, he is a first term commissioner on the Cook County Board, and probably the two most high profile things he's done in office were uh, pushing through a resolution that was non-binding that called for the county to move money from law enforcement to social service programs in the wake of the George Floyd protests and unrest. And that, of course, is defund the police. He also pushed through a piece of legislation that makes it illegal for landlords to discriminate against potential renters who have certain kinds of criminal records. And that, he said, was an effort to help people returning from jail, returning from prison, rebuild their lives. So that is a good sense of what kind of candidate he would be, very progressive. And whoever gets the endorsement of the Chicago Teachers Union will be a force to be reckoned with as sort of the anointed progressive candidate in the race. Will that be enough to defeat Lori Lightfoot? Time will tell. <laughs> so Paris, you know, beyond those CTU connections, what more do we know about Johnson's politics? Well, I think Heather, as Cook County Commissioner, Heather brought up the, the major things that he was uh, supportive of in, in, during his current tenure as Cook County Commissioner. He's very progressive. He's a member of the former member of the Chicago Teachers Union, former teacher. Uh, I think that the defund the police thing might come back and haunt him. It seems like this cycle is setting itself up to be uh, one where those that maybe are a little uh, more pro-public safety, pro-law enforcement, I mean, Mayor Lightfoot has taken a more pro-law enforcement, pro-public safety stance. We'll see how that dynamic shapes up. I think the progressive lane here is going to be very crowded uh, in this race, but the CTU has tremendous resources, uh, and although those resources did not help Tony Preckwinkle win uh, four years ago, so we'll see. Uh, Heather, why announce an exploratory run? Why not just say you're running? Well, he said that he wants to test the waters and make sure that if he does run for mayor, he will have the support of truly a coalition of progressive groups. And Paris is right. He will face criticism of that defund the police position position, but he's going to look at the success of State Rep Delia Ramirez in the third congressional district race to say that's not toxic. People understand that there is a need to rethink public safety, to rethink law enforcement, to rethink violence reduction in Chicago, and he wants to make that case before sort of going full bore into an election campaign. So oh, Amanda yeah. Also, you get two press pops out of it, right, Brandis? Yeah. I mean, he gets to, we're, right. we're talking about him now, and then if he actually declares, then that's, ooh, pressure building. So part of that can be strategy on the candidate's part. Uh, Amanda, also saying that he's running or mulling a run for mayor is former Governor Pat Quinn, who says the city needs rescuing, believes that he's the man for the job. He also says that he's done his own poll recently, and it gives him 42 uh, percent over Lightfoot's 31 percent. How strong a candidate do you think he'd be? Well, so we haven't actually seen that poll, don't know who else it is, if it's a one-to-one -one match. And we certainly know that at least until and if there is a runoff, this race will not be that. I, I think it's telling that when you had somebody that had statewide recognition, as he did, of course, as a former mayor, he didn't win the Democratic nomination for the attorney general's office. Instead, he came in second. So formidable, yes, by way of name recognition, but this isn't necessarily um, you know, an aldermatic or a state rep race. This is a race for mayor. So while you need to have that name recognition, the folks who bubble up to the top um, and are, are not going to be worrying about that. So I, I think that Quinn is somebody who loves to rattle cages. He likes to pass up petitions. He likes to run for office. Might he do it? I wouldn't be surprised. Would I be bowled over if he wins? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Heather, of the candidates that have announced or may announce shortly uh, that they're running, uh, which of them do you think Mayor Lightfoot should be concerned about, and who are we still waiting to hear from? Well, we're still waiting to hear from Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia. He said today at a City Hall news conference to endorse his pick for three aldermanic races that he was still considering running for mayor. He said that he hadn't come to a decision yet and loved being in Congress and was enjoying his work there. But if he runs, he is certainly somebody who has that name recognition that Amanda was talking about to sort of vault himself into that top tier. I honestly would be surprised to see both Garcia and Johnson run 
at the same time because of course Chewy Garcia was a Cook County commissioner when the CTU tapped him to run for mayor against Rahm Emanuel in 2015. He forced Rahm Emanuel into the city's first ever mayoral runoff and I would be surprised if two such close CTU allies would go head to head. Uh, so the Bears this week, they released renderings of a proposed multi-purpose entertainment district anchored by a world-class stadium in Arlington Heights. Paris, at this point, do you think the Bears have made their decision um, or is it possible that the team could stay in Chicago? I absolutely think they've made their decision, Brandis, and I think the only thing that would keep this from becoming a reality is if the McCaskies, the Bears owners, can't find the financing to put this mega project together. I mean, it is a mega project. And you heard the Bears this week saying, hey, by the way, we do want public financing just for everything but the stadium portion of this. But all those other things, the entertainment part, the mixed use developments, we want a little help with that. I don't know what kind of political climate there is right now or what there will be in a couple of years and, and whether or not anyone will support that. We'll, we'll see where that goes. There's already groups uh, saying mm -hmm. the Bears are multi valued at $5 billion. They don't need the political help. So if they can't get together the financing, maybe there's a chance. But I do think there is no chance they're staying in Soldier Field. I, I've always thought the only chance the Bears have to stay in Chicago or Chicago has to keep the Bears is to offer them another piece of land where they can build their big dream stadium and mixed-use development. And Chicago has plenty of that. There's the Southworks site uh, uh, you know, where the U.S. Steel used to be. There's the 78. There's no indication that the mayor has, has offered anything like that. It's just putting this dome over Soldier Field, which I don't think is ever going to happen. And so here's what Mayor Lightfoot did say about the Bears plans yesterday. We're going to continue our discussions. We're going to continue our discussions, <coughs> excuse me, with the league. Um, but as you know, I'm some, somebody who likes to plan. So we've got Plan B, Plan C, um, and others um, in the works as well if the Bears decide that they're going to abandon the city of Chicago. I hope they don't, and we're going to keep fighting that fight uh, as long as we possibly can. Paris, how politically damaging could it be for the mayor if the Bears walk on her watch? I think if she isn't seen as doing everything she can to keep the Bears in good faith, then it it might be politically damaging. But I, I do think that the sentiment out there right now is this Arlington Heights deal is the best deal for the Bears, and, and fans kind of understand that. They understand Soldier Field is outdated. They understand the Bears can't really compete with the stadium revenue of some of these newer stadiums in markets like Los Angeles. So this might be a fait accompli. It might not rest at the mayor's footsteps if the Bears do indeed go. But as I said, did you do everything? to try and keep them? Did you offer them big pieces of land? Did you say, build your big dream stadium, do it here on the lakefront or here at the 78? So that that's going to determine whether or not she, you know, is affected politically. And Amanda, I know that you're going to have more uh, from Arlington Heights for us uh, tomorrow. But Heather, I want to pivot to Texas Governor Greg Abbott busing another 103 migrants from Texas to Chicago. That's a total of 228 in seven days, as we said earlier. Is there a sense in which this is a story that works well for both Abbott and Lightfoot, both of them sort of playing to their bases over this? Absolutely. Mayor Lightfoot has relished the, champ, the chance to champion Chicago's immigrant community, particularly the undocumented immigrant community. She went to Union Station uh, twice this week and once to the Salvation Army, where many of the migrants have taken shelter. She wants Chicago to be known as a sanctuary city, and she has minced no words in criticizing Texas Governor Greg Abbott as un-American, unchristian, and essentially unfeeling for sending these people, including some very small children from Texas to Chicago. I should say that he has sent other buses to Washington, D.C. and New York City as well. So this is part of an orchestrated strategy from Governor Abbott, who, like Lori Lightfoot, is up for re-election. So, uh, Amanda, we've got about a minute. The day after Labor Day, Governor Pritzker and his GOP challenger for Governor Darren Bailey sparring over crime, uh, with Bailey criticizing bail reform and calling uh, Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox, Pritzker, and Mayor Lightfoot the three musketeers of crime, chaos, and tragedy. That's a direct quote. Uh, Bailey has previously called Chicago a hellhole. Uh, recent polls have him down by 20 points. 
how's all this going to fly with voters in 45 well, seconds? <laughs> so, Brandis, you know, um, Darren Bailey recently trying to really hammer this notion home. He came out with his plan for safety that he said includes giving basically additional money to police across the state, reinstating the death penalty. He's something he's previously called for, particularly for those who kill police officers. So it's something that he's trying to hammer home. But by the way, he held that press conference in Springfield. He really hasn't done a whole lot for a guy who doesn't have a lot of money to spend on campaign ads. He hasn't been particularly present holding press conferences, getting that free media in trying to hammer this home in a way that would really reach voters. So he's having a real tough time. While, by the way, Pritzker having a bit of a national moment yet again. He got the Van Fair treatment, a very positive write up in that. Yeah. All right. Oh, all right. So that means we'll have to check out our copies of Vanity Fair and more to talk about next week on Spotlight, of course. That's this week. Thanks, Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. Up next, we talk with three members of Chicago's first civilian police oversight board. That's in a conversation that first aired on Chicago Tonight Black Voices. But first, a look at the weather. Mayor Lori Lightfoot recently announced the seven interim commissioners who will make up the Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability, Chicago's first civilian police oversight board. And they're charged with a tall order, rebuilding public trust in the Chicago Police Department. The announcement comes several months behind schedule, which means it was a long wait for a short term. Because the members of the commission must be elected, this interim commission has only months until an election of three member councils for each of the city's 22 police districts is held. Here's Mayor Lightfoot speaking on the new commission late last month. The most important steps that we can take in bringing peace, lasting peace and safety to our communities is by getting the community involved and engaged and feeling like they've got a stake. Joining us now are three of the interim commissioners, Cliff Nellis, founder and executive director of the Lawndale Christian Legal Center, Anthony Driver Jr., community activist and public affairs specialist, and Ramel Terry, second vice president of the Chicago Westside NAACP. Thanks to all three of you for joining us. Um, first, I'm curious about why you wanted to be a part of this commission. Uh, Ramel Terry, I'll start with you, please. Thank you, Brandis, for having us. Uh, so. I'm a lifelong uh, Chicagoan as well as a West Sider, and uh, my level of involvement in this issue is that, and I'm just a believer that if you do not involve in, to affect change, then who will? So we can't sit on the sidelines and just complain. We have to take that big leap forward and take action to see the change that we desire. Cliff Nellis, same question to you. Yeah, thank you, Brandis. So I, this is personal for me. I moved into North Lawndale 13 years ago and started the Lawndale Christian Legal Center with Lawndale Community Church. And so for the past 13 years, I've specialized in representing young people in conflict with the law, uh, young people under 25 years old. And I've seen um, some good policing and I've seen some not so good some policing. And, and I think this commission, the importance of it and why I wanted to be a part of it is because we really believe and I really believe that community solutions for public safety need to play a bigger role in the city and that community voice uh, is an important component of, of a good police department. Anthony Driver Jr., why did you want to be a part of this commission, even on an interim basis? Yes, um, it's something that's very personal to me as a lifelong Southsider. Uh, I'm a person who's directly impacted uh, by violence. I've lost uh, 21 friends and family members to gun violence in the city. Um, and also, it's, it's something that has been around, and, and the call for civilian oversight has been around since uh, the assassination of Chairman Fred Hampton in the days of Mayor Harold Washington. Uh, so for the last five years, I've worked to try to pass this ordinance, um, and now to be blessed with the opportunity to serve on the interim commission, I'm very grateful for it. 21 friends and family members, Anthony, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, Ramel Terry, you know, there have been a lot of attempts uh, to increase policing accountability before. Why do you think uh, civilian input into policing will make a difference this time. 
I think civilian input allows for there to be equitable solutions that benefit the whole, right? Like oftentimes decisions are being made in a silo, but here's an opportunity to elevate community concerns and their voices to the forefront, allowing them to have buy-in to the decisions that are being made. And oftentimes they're being dictated to, and here's an opportunity for them to have power and what's actually being determined and everything is out in the open, is transparent. And so what better time than any for all of this hard work that went into creating this legislation to happen now. Cliff Nellis, what are, what are the top priorities, maybe even job one for you and your fellow interim commissioners? Well, we are just starting. And so uh, we've kind of agreed that we wouldn't want to start to talk about any initiatives or policy right out the gate without getting to know one another uh, first and, and have some consensus on our commission with that. But I will say that one of the things we do wanna put a big plug in is, is this hyper-local approach requires massive community involvement. And step one is these district councils that uh, we wanna encourage everyone to come on out and run for these positions. As you mentioned at the opening, there's three per precinct, that's 66 total. This is the first time Chicago has had such a democratic hyper-local process to get community voices from every community, not just some communities, but every community by having these local district council elections. So we would, our first, I think we can safely say our first goal is to make sure everybody knows district councils are open and please uh, apply and run for that office. Okay, uh, Anthony Driver, you know, in a city like Chicago, is it possible um, for all communities to be policed equitably and the same? Um, I think that the jury's still out on that, you know, so my, my hope is that the answer is yes, um, but, but to be honest, I, I'm not sure. But what I will say is that I, I do have a lot of faith in this commission, um, and more importantly, I have a lot of faith in the residents of Chicago uh, who will eventually serve on these district councils um, to try to right the wrongs of the past. Chicago has a very notorious history uh, from the likes of uh, police officers like John Burge and, and, you know, being one of the torture capitals of the United States. Um, and there's a long way to go, but I, I have full faith in the residents of this city uh, and the folks that who will serve on this district councils as well as um, myself and the interim commission to do our best to try to right those wrongs and to, to get to a more equitable place. So taking the, the three of you as a cross section of this interim commission, you know, it is racially, geographically, age diverse, um, professionally diverse. Ramel, do you think that um, there will also be a diversity of perspectives uh, by having such a diverse uh, commission now and, and down the road once it's elected? I definitely think that there will be diverse perspectives. Like we all, um, though we've been doing this work, none of us have really worked that closely together. I think maybe two of us have worked closely together. So I think that there will be a lot of diversity and I'm excited for that opportunity because we all bring different talents to the table and we have different relationships, which will allow us, you know, with that community buy-in to be very effective. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Cliff, this is something that you mentioned as far as raising awareness so that people know to run, but how do you ensure that, you know, the, the sort of the corruption of politics that can exist sometimes in Chicago uh, doesn't breed into the election system, um, but at the same time balance that against um, making sure that there, there, there are 66 seats that are filled by people who are interested in doing the job um, versus compared to the education, the school district's LSCs, which sometimes they struggle to get people to run and fill positions. Yeah, I think that is one of our first and, and, and highest priorities. It's one of the things that I believe all of us was selected for this position for by Mayor Lightfoot was because of our deep connections to local community. So it will be upon all of seven of us to make sure that we are, you know, getting into the community and making sure that people are made aware of this new opportunity, the significance of it, the importance of it, the value it can bring to their family, to their block, to their neighborhood, to their community, to the city of Chicago and to policing in general. I, too, just think we've got a great commission. I've been really pleased with uh, the, my seven colleagues, and I think uh, we're up for the task. Um, Anthony Driver, what does success for this interim commission look like for you? Success for this interim commission to me looks like an empowered community. It's a community that knows when uh, this commission is meeting publicly. It's when we're having these meetings that the community shows up in mass, that they know that they now have a voice at the table. Um, that we no longer have to balance, you know, strong council, weak mayor, strong mayor, weak council. Now the residents of the city have a direct voice 
uh, and how their communities are policed from the co from COPA to uh, the police superintendent to the CAPS program, um, you name it. You, you now have a voice and a role in this process from all of those things I named as well as the police board. So the, a success for me is when the residents, the everyday residents, not just a privileged few, uh, know that they have a voice in the process and they feel heard and seen um, and empowered. Okay, well, congrats on your appointments and best of luck to you. You've got a big job ahead. Uh, Ramel Terry, Cliff Nellis, and Anthony Driver Jr., thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com slash news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. A stop at the old racetrack that the Chicago Bears plan to transform into their new stadium. We'll have a live report from Arlington Heights. Plus, former Bears player James Big Cat Williams previews the team's season in advance of Sunday's kickoff. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Parrish Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a great evening.